really big. We just have to make sure that it's going to be inclusive and, uh, and uh, that we really imagine the opportunities to make education more inclusive and not just thinking about how we can use this technology innovation to give more to those who, who already have um, uh, a lot of access and, and resources. I hope that kind of <laughs> addresses some of the issues. Yes, yes, excellent. And, and so we, we have Claudia also from uh, uh, until here online. So would you comment something more what Tina said? Hi, everyone. Yes, just to add on how important, as Tina mentioned, inclusivity is when considering this. And uh, when thinking of anything do it, uh, remotely about education and programs, connecting this user, the end user from the beginning to end. So making sure that anything is done in a co-creation way, not just uh, in a the validating phase to understand whether the user is okay with it or not, but considering its ideas as well from the beginning to end. I think I'll leave it at that and let you continue, but thanks for, for having me here. Um, then, then we have Douglas from uh... Lidiki work from, from Kenya. So Douglas, so you have a nice use to see the education as well and, and being active in e-sport and, and gaming. So how do you see at the moment and tell something about your background as well. Uh, thanks, Lori. Uh, thanks for having me and excited to be a part of this initiative. Uh, my name is Douglas Ogeto from Ludicrox. Uh, which is a video game publishing company based out of Africa, um, supporting studios as well as people within esports. Um, so I think to build on your question around education, I think uh, very good points raised by uh, Claudia um, and our fellow panelist uh, earlier. Um, I think uh, maybe just something I'd probably add is the application. So I think if, if you look at ed education, there's definitely been a good shift and maybe students at this point have the beauty about learning and being able to apply. Um, I think if you look at, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it was just, you know, learning for memorization uh, where you don't see the day-to-day practicability, but I think where education is heading, for example, in gaming is that, yeah, you know, you could, you, you're able to learn uh, and, and taking stuff like, for example, art and music, you're also able to uh, potentially integrate into gaming as well. So I hope uh, this helps answer your question. Thank you. And, and now we have also Matt Aro online. So uh, just briefly, Matt, tell something about your background and also, so you have been writing this this uh, uh, discussion paper around uh, education. So with Tina, so you just uh, provide some ideas. Okay, now I can speak. Morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Mart, and uh, I'm really sorry for being late. I, I just received a call from the Estonian uh, Ministry of Education uh, just before I was supposed to come here. And uh, so the, the discussion uh, went a lot longer than I anticipated. Uh, so um, we're just uh, starting to discuss again uh, the strategic uh, side of the cooperation between innovators of education in Estonia and the Ministry of Education. And, um, <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a quite, uh, quite fascinating uh, moment in time. Uh, the, the, in Estonia, there are, are big structural changes coming. Uh, so um, uh, we are merging together uh, all of the major uh, organizations uh, under, the, under the Ministry of Education. Uh, so. Um, um, this might not be uh, the, the most important uh, for, for you guys at the moment, but um, uh, but uh, yes, um, uh, the, the the national uh, mm -hmm. education digital um, uh, association is is moved together with um, uh, 
uh, with all the all the other major organizations. So there will be a, a new, like a similar organization, to Opa Salitus in in Finland will be will be created. Um, but yes, uh, together with uh, Tina Noven and from uh, uh, UN um, Technology Innovation Labs, uh, we have been working now the past three months on um, uh, writing together a concept paper on um, uh, how how could we empower communities uh, globally to come up with uh, solutions to the educational issues that they see and uh, how to enable these uh, solutions to become uh, globally applicable and scalable. Uh, so um, the, the primary idea um, is, um, well, uh, creating an education innovation ecosystem uh, that uh, enables anybody uh, to come up with, uh, with ideas or, or solutions to, to educational problems. And um, and then um, uh, there would be support systems in in, pay, in place um, uh, to to help this uh, uh, grow up uh, into uh, into uh, big um, uh, big providers. So, for example, if we are today looking at solving um, an educational problem in our school in our village somewhere, um, say in the middle of Finland, then we would straight away uh, um, have the idea that. Um, hey, if we are solving this problem here for us and we are happy with the solution, then maybe there is another school in the other side of the world that has the same problem and we could uh, help them with our solution, actually. And, uh, and uh, they also would know straight away that, oh, uh, uh, for example, at the UN uh, Technology Innovation Labs, there is a specialist uh, that can help us. Um, uh, so we need to have this kind of uh, structure in place as well who could help um, the, the let's say innovators of education uh, to um, to uh, figure out how to move forward with um, with their um, solution. Um, maybe in short, that's it. But uh, but if anybody is interested, like um, what an ecosystem means, then then I, I've developed a nice story to explain what is an ecosystem. So maybe I'll go go into this for a second as well. <clears throat> So, for example, let's imagine that we want to plant a forest. We want to grow a forest, and uh, but we we only have a desert um, uh, where we can grow. So let's imagine that we have this. We are the owners of Sahara Desert, and we want to grow a forest. And now we start planting trees there, and um, and unfortunately, all of the trees die because the existing ecosystem in the Sahara Desert is not suitable for for a forest, obviously. And we also can understand very quickly why these trees are are dying. I mean, firstly, there there's not enough uh, humidity, uh, and secondly, there is uh, way too much heat, so the trees are basically boiling. And and then we, when we fix these two problems, we are already a lot more likely that the trees are going to survive. Uh, so the same situation we we need to look at in education innovation as well. Um, so. Uh, and the quality of the ecosystem, I'm measuring uh, this way that, um, um, I mean, you always have ideas how to make things better. And now uh, these are kind of seedlings, these ideas. And how many of these ideas are actually talked about and how many of them are materializing into something. And then you can measure, uh, I mean, the most uh, high quality uh, ecosystem is where, where you have all the nice uh, support systems in place. So from an idea, you will have a billion dollar uh, company uh, after, let's say, 10 years. So this would be uh, an ideal ecosystem. And uh, in the general tech uh, world, we can see really good ecosystems in place. For example, Silicon Valley. Uh, Estonia has also quite a nice ecosystem. Um, uh, so it's, it, I mean, based on, on the fact that, uh, that there are uh, four, um, four um, uh, Giants, tech giants in Estonia already, only with a country of only one, 1.3 million uh, people. So uh, it shows that the ecosystem is quite okay. Um, any questions? Yeah. So so uh, let's continue, and and so you can write uh, questions all the time to the chat. Uh, but now, so why we chose this education as one of our topics? Uh, or we call it as a, as a vertical or potential vertical for 5G as well. Uh, so far, the education is always mentioned to belong to smart city concept or smart city vertical of 5G. 
uh, but but uh, we see the potential of education as, as the vertic vertical of 5G of its own. And, and now, especially when we think that, uh, okay, our first challenge is to provide learning and application of 5G globally, fast. So then we start to think differently. So how we can speed up the, the learning and application of 5G globally. And on the other hand, the 5G itself as a technology could help us to, to create the next generation education. And, and uh, what we have heard already about the, the needs and, and aims of education. So the education has been very much uh, nationally optimized, mm. uh, not globally optimized. And thinking about the big challenges we have in our hands now, so we need to think differently also for for the education system. And now this is perfect time to think how in the beginning, how, how we uh, speed up the learning around 5G, an application of 5G globally, and then whether we are able to utilize 5G technology for the, let's say, new global education system, uh, which would provide ecosystem like uh, Matt just mentioned, uh, even to those areas which are not so successful at the moment concerning learning. And, and also what, what we have found out, especially concerning education, that um, the, the aim of education is not just providing degrees and, and uh, diplomas, but uh, it's most likely to provide uh, meaningful work and, and uh, good, meaningful life. And uh, that's why we need broader view of education, not, not just thinking it as, as a learning system. But now, uh, after after mention these words, so I would like to again uh, uh, ask Tina to to uh, continue. How how do you see about the the uh, opportunities for global education system uh, when we utilize technology more? Thanks. Uh, I think there's definitely a lot of a uh, lot of opportunities, and um, as I said, I think one of the challenges is indeed what you mentioned that um, the school systems, especially in formal education, they are tied to the national standards and curricula and so on. And now, if you think about the world of learning and the world of informal learning and, and online learning and access to to educational resources and and um, cooperation that connectivity has made uh, possible for us. Um, I, I, for instance, I worked um, in the remote remote villages between Tanzania and Kenya when, when I was working in East Africa. And uh, it was amazing that you go to a school, uh, you, you have to first fly. We flew to Serengeti and then it took about a day by car, this little dirt road to get to the villages. And then children there, they uh, get through the satellite uh, internet uh, co-create projects together with children from the other side of the world. So we had a partnering school and, and the children uh, from different schools creating projects together, and um, and and that was that was um, almost unimaginable some years back. And if you if you think about these villages where we worked um, as well, um, even mobile phones didn't work that well there. But now now the technology is like the edge. You can get these like cheap edge chips that I use in drones, for instance, for, for quite cheaply already. So um, getting places um, connected to internet just opens up the whole world of opportunities that wasn't there before. And if you think about especially emerging countries, uh, which don't have the analog infra, the leapfrogging opportunities are amazing. But the problem is that when you think about like uh, service development and innovation, it often happens in very different contexts with people with very different needs and who kind of um, think in terms of improving the services that are available through the analog uh, systems. 
but then when you go to to completely different setting, you have to kind of um, start imagining the opportunities from a completely uh, different starting point. And that's why why I think it's so important that, um, um, as Claudia was also emphasizing, that we uh, create platforms for this kind of co-creation to happen and uh, use these technologies as enabling uh, platforms for the co-creation and, and co-innovation, especially where that kind of education and learning needs um, are the highest. And I think there are great opportunities in, let's say, in formalizing what we call now informal education. So this is the kind of the whole world of, of um, learning that is, is available through connectivity to everybody. But now we ha just have to make sure that people also are able to um, able to be recognized for the skills that they learn, not just for the skills that be able to um, kind of gain through the formal education, but also through the informal uh, informal education. And uh, here again, we, we need to create kind of global infrastructure for um, for the recognition of, of skills, the new taxonomies, what we mean by skills and capabilities. Uh, it's not just the degrees that you have that makes you valuable and capable as a person, but it's a much broader um, broader uh, combination of skills and capabilities and abilities that we are able to apply uh, in a practice. And also, if you think about uh, the world, world that is changing really fast, we don't even know what are the kind of future skills uh, in very specific kind of tangible technical terms. So we can maybe talk about uh, broad skills and, and kind of uh, maintaining learning capabilities and kind of giving everybody the, the imagination and um, understanding that what are the kind of resources they can access, for instance, when they have access to connectivity, what it enables. And I, I think we have to work much more about um, imagining the opportunities in specific context first to even understand what this means, because it's such a big leap that's happening right now and, and kind of unforeseen that. Um, it's, it's difficult to even see how it can change things. And, and also um, humans are quite, I think, especially in Finland, we are really task oriented. So we want to jump to the solutions without uh, really understanding the problems and context properly work first. And I think this is great about, about uh, fast connect connections because people can really work together and kind of in, immerse it by utilizing um, VR and AR technologies as well, we can come together. Um, almost like in in real uh, life, and um, uh, and and kind of uh, touch and communicate with uh, any three D designs and so on and so on. So this this makes um, makes it much easier to understand and empathize um, with people who are in different contexts because it's another dimension to to, to communication and, and understanding that hasn't been uh, available to to us um, before um, and. Um, I think there are kind of cutting edge, amazing opportunities. We can use the robotics uh, enabled by 5G to help Rohingya uh, refugees to learn in their native language, which is not a written, written language because we can use the kind of auto translate and, and uh, audio technologies to, to enable that. So that's amazing. But in reality, we still have to start with very basic problems. For instance, there's a lot of schools in the world that um, uh, we, we don't even know. The authorities don't know where the schools are. Um, we just had um, visitors from the Ministry of Education from Nigeria last afternoon. They said they are really struggling uh, just because of this problem that they don't know even where the schools are. So <laughs> how do you provide support when you don't even know who, who the people uh, you are dealing with are and, and where they are? And how do you kind of create a baseline of understanding uh, what is the support needed when you don't have this information? So, for, for instance, UNICEF has this quite ambitious project globally to map all the schools in the world by using satellite uh, imaginary and, um, and, and that kind of thing. So, you really have to start often with the basics um, to have the real data for the, for the planning and, and kind of policy um, and, and resource allocation. But um, that's why, why this kind of world of innovation is so exciting because um, we are working on, on different, different levels and uh, kind of mapping the systems globally, but then also um, trying to come up with really specific solutions to specific challenges for, for a specific group of learners as well. 
Yes, thank you very much. So uh, the star story behind the star node is uh, very much the one that we didn't ask whether we are offering this course globally. So even with a very small marketing, so we have now uh, uh, participants from 33 countries and, and just tells the, the opportunity we have at hand. See, we just change the, the way we think and, and now uh, sponsored by the 5G providers and, and uh, operators behind us. Uh, who have the interest, of course, to, to spread the, the 5G technology, but also to pro pro provide the, the opportunity for good. And, and what you mentioned about the, the case of Nigeria, so similar types of stories from India, that can you imagine that we have the class and there is 600 students in the one class or like children. Mm. So it, they are like totally different problems uh, uh, we have uh, in Finland, but uh, with the technology and, and the, the, let's say the new way of thinking education and, and co combine the education for the challenges of the world. So that, that might be the case. And, and also when we started uh, to establish the Start Nord Society, so uh, we carried out the pilot study in the US and, and once we interviewed the, the Americans, uh, uh, specialists around the education, so somebody said that with that money, uh, USA is uh, spending for education. The whole world should be educated. And just telling the, the, the opportunities we have, if we just change the way we utilize that, that money. But now we have uh, Douglas uh, uh, online, and, and let's let's uh, uh, move the, the question to to him. So, coming from Africa and seeing the, the world from there, uh, of course, being around the world. So, how how do you see this discussion now? Uh, thanks. Uh... Lori for the question. So I think uh, very interesting insights from Tina as well. Um, so I think from, from at least uh, where I see it, uh, definitely technology has come a long way. Um, definitely with, with the advancement of uh, internet uh, in Kenya and across the continent, this is definitely uh, shaping education. Um, I think uh, if, if I could touch on the formal aspect, I think there's some, you know, we also have, we are a local partner for Start North and that we, we have seen a number of students uh, sign up for the, the course, for the 5G course, uh, which is also quite good because we are seeing a lot of co collaboration between uh, African students as well as the, the rest of the students from across the globe. Um, and, and, and if you look at where this is heading, you know, like gamification is an industry that is, is rapidly coming up. And this 5G will be able to help this because um, students need to learn how to co-create. Um, if you look at education right now, the way it's moving, you know, how, how do you enable students with different skills to be able to come together, to be able to build projects that, you know, either solve a real world, real world case scenario, or at least help them understand, you know, what where the world is heading to. So, Definitely, this this will help uh, students be able to take up such opportunities. Um, the price of data has also been uh, drastically decreasing, so it's becoming much more affordable for people to move online. Um, as you all may know, Africa has the largest uh, number of youth population, which is doubling, I think, at four percent annually. Um, so, so, so more people are coming online, and they'll be able to uh, learn and work with different people. Um, also, this has enabled uh, building of local ed tech solutions. So for example, we have uh, startups who are building solutions that are, uh, are available via USSD. Um, and this actually helps students be able to revise where so they're able to get their homework on, on devices. Um, and as they revise, the teacher is able to get statistics of their performance. And this is actually and it helps them to be able to provide personalized uh, learning. Um, and then lastly, on the formal side, I think uh, definitely gaming, uh, video games is helping uh, build teamwork. Uh, for example, 
you know, the more you play, you definitely learn the value of not just working by your, for your, by yourself, but how to work with different people with different skills, personality, and knowledge, etc. Um, and then just to build on the earlier point, we also now have local game developers building games uh, that are helping towards um, towards learning. So you, we have studios building, let's say, math games, and these math games are now because different games work differently in different markets. So being able to localize this is also helping uh, taking up taking up of learning by young people. Um, and then I think on an informal section, um, definitely we're seeing gaming helping. Uh, Tina also touched a bit on this, skills such as imagination, empathy, um, and competitiveness. Um, definitely it's important for a student to think of them as a global student, not just like a Kenyan, South African student, etc. So I hope, um, uh, so just to answer your questions, Yeah, so so yeah, so definitely uh, we, we are seeing students now being part of, part of the larger global education ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. So now listen to this. So how how about you would think about it? And also knowing that uh, Estonia has really uh, focused on the digitalization of the whole country uh, and uh, other countries could learn about that as well. So the education could be uh, part of the, the uh, let's say the bigger plan to digitalize the services of, of the country. So how, how do you see the opportunities what we have in hand? Sorry, I lost you. So, Mert, Mert Arro, so did you hear this question or comment? I, um, I kind of tried to imagine like uh, how, to, how to reply to this uh, in a meaningful way. So, um, uh, Estonia is, uh, is one of the leading e-countries e in the world, uh, for sure. Um, depending on, on what kind of data you look at, uh, Finland is actually now getting ahead in in some aspects actually at, at least uh, so and I've, I've been analyzing a lot uh, why Estonia became uh, so big player in in the government government technology and um, and if I look back in in time uh, then um, uh, democratizing um, uh, the innovation of public services uh, was uh, I believe the most important uh, factor for this and how this happened was that um, uh, most countries in the world, uh, when they started to uh, offer public services with the help of uh, software, um, then they started to build um, kind of um, silos. Uh, so each ministry uh, would have their own silo database that wasn't very well talking to the other ministries. And there was actually sometimes there was big difficulties to exchange the data between the ministries. Estonia took a totally different approach uh, by enabling um, communication between uh, various um, uh, parties. Um, and um, I think the story is actually quite nice. So um, what Estonia did was um, they, they noticed that uh, the government noticed that they don't have money. They, Estonia was basically um, uh, bankrupt after Soviet Union collapsed, uh, and um, and so uh, the whole government budget was a hundred million dollars, <laughs> and uh, and then uh, they turned to uh, IBM, for example, and asked, okay, could you provide us with a modern infrastructure um, for the country? And IBM was like, yeah, for hundred million dollars, we could we could do that, <laughs> but of course, it's absurd to spend the whole government budget on um, on setting up uh, digital infrastructure. And uh, so the, the the guys in the government were young, and they were thinking, okay, who who has who has money? Who would like to help us with uh, setting up uh, proper infrastructure? And uh, they thought, hmm, private sector has some money, and the banks have money, and let's let's go and talk to these guys. And so they went to the banks, and they said, guys, we need to exchange data between each other. So uh, let's set up an infrastructure together. 
And actually, the fun, fun fact is that about 60% of the initial funding of the government infrastructure in Estonia was privately funded. But uh, it also created a very positive movement. Uh, so um, <clears throat> the, um, the, the private sector um, and the government uh, were working together. And so they actually built an infrastructure where everybody was welcomed. So uh, even small organizations could uh, tap in uh, to the government system and, uh, and they start exchanging their data uh, with other, uh, other parties, if it was necessary for them, of course, to get this license. And, uh, and this is how the, the like, X road was born. Uh, we call it the X road. So there is a, a secure layer for data exchange between uh, government and, and private sector uh, organizations in Estonia. And uh, you already see how the democratization then happened. So um, uh, we Estonians also copied um, the digital identity from Finland uh, and implemented this uh, a lot more successfully than Finland. Uh, so almost everybody is using a digital identity in Estonia. And uh, this enabled uh, a user base to be created. And this made it very attractive for everybody to start uh, building services uh, that uh, are, are available um, in um, let's say, in the government, uh, I don't know, infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so, so now you have a, uh, an ecosystem where you have uh, users and you have people that are motivated to provide services. And this is how about one and a half thousand services were built within just a matter of a few years. And literally today you have only three things that you cannot do online in, if you're talking about government uh, interaction. First thing is you cannot get married. Second thing, you cannot get divorced. And the third thing, you cannot sell property online. So all of the other things you are able to do more or less online. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, everybody is very, very thankful for this. And now um, I, I hope this story helps to, uh, I mean, if there is so many different nationalities here, helps to um, understand um, like what to do in, in other countries. and. Uh, and based on this Estonian experience that uh, if we are democratizing um, kind of innovation, uh, then um, we, can, we can use this experience uh, also improving the quality of education. And, and I think Tina was putting it very well before that uh, we have no idea. I mean, the world is changing so fast now. We have no idea uh, what's coming um, tomorrow. Uh, but uh, if we enable people uh, all over the world uh, to come up with solutions to the educational problems that they see in their village or in their community, then we are a lot more likely to, to tackle uh, the, uh, the, the educational issues that there are. And I'm not even talking about the uh, quality of, uh, of and, and speed of learning and quality of learning experience. Um, I just talked to an Icelandic uh, guy a few weeks ago who um, introduced me uh, his PhD work that that uh, they've done on uh, researching the flow theory in, in education development. Um, so uh, I, just in case mentioning what the flow theory is. So flow theory says that uh, people are the best uh, developing when they are about 85% of the time right in what they're doing. Um, and and uh, what happens is that if you're 100% of the time right, and so you know very well what you're doing, you know exactly what's coming, uh, we are not uh, um, motivated for a long time. We are actually losing motivation very quickly because it's boring. We are not developing ourselves. And uh, at the same time, if we are more than 20% of the time wrong, we are getting the feeling that hmm, it's too hard for me. I, I can't really get this. I should do something else. So we're also losing motivation. And uh, the kind of optimum point for humans seems to, seems to be about 85% time we need to be correct. And based on this theory, they built a mathematics learning game for uh, primary schools. And uh, the outcome uh, is based on the previous, uh, based on the first research, the outcome is that um, the kids are learning up to 12 times faster compared to the uh, traditional curriculum based learning. So, um, I mean, uh, and, and you have this kind of amazing stories all over the world now. It, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, which country or which village the innovation is coming from. Uh, there, there is such amazing stories. Another example from Estonia 
this was so this was an Icelandic example just to make sure that we have several countries covered um, an Estonian example uh, there is an innovation called linguist uh, which is uh, a, 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 a guy who had to go to work in CERN as a scientist and he was really annoyed that he needs to learn French uh, and he, he, it was very very hard to do it with uh, existing methodologies so he started to think, okay, how could we use modern technology in, in teaching languages? And uh, so they built a machine learning based um, uh, uh, system uh, to support uh, language learning. And um, I'm not going give, even into the te uh, theoretical background of it. Uh, they used also, I mean, when we look at the theories that are being used in modern um, innovation of education, so flow theory is actually, it was developed in the 70s. So we are talking about a very old theory. Uh, some of the theories, uh, psychological theories that we are using today in, uh, the, in innovating education are more than 100 years old, but they are still not used in general education because uh, nobody bothered. I mean, um, uh, and now they are, they are able to provide really good results. So, but Lingvist uh, was now researched by Tartu University, which is the main uh, research university from Estonia. And... Uh, mm -hmm they showed that uh, uh, it was 400% uh, more efficient to use linguists for studying languages than tr uh, traditional uh, curriculum-based studies. So I'm just giving a few examples, uh, but I mean, if we would have a good ecosystem in place where we are able to figure out uh, quickly if the idea that we have now, the new innovation in education is, is uh, fruitful in certain contexts and, and then figure out also what context they are useful in, uh, this would, this would definitely boost the innovation of education. And of course, uh, 5G or 6G are, 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 um, are a good, um, I mean, infrastructure is, is always a key as well. Uh, it needs to be in place. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to develop other services. Thanks for, for listening to my, my monologue again. <laughs> so, so that was great monologue. Uh, so coming back to what Tina mentioned earlier that uh, in Nigeria, so the challenge is first to, to identify the people. So this is uh, uh, e-identity could be the starting point and, and the new way to, to organize things in, in the society. So now, now I, I could ask Claudia now after her this, this discussion so far. So how, how do you see the, the, the discussion going? Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Um, I think two things have been mentioning quite a lot and they're quite important. One is reimagining uh, and the other one is collaboration. Collaboration was not mentioned as a word itself, but from the example of, of Mart, it's very clear how important it is to uh, be able to share what we all learn from each other, like in the case of the North, but also being able to uh, being able to learn from each other's uh, mistakes and also how after working together, there is something bigger that can be built out of this. And I think that's key as well. It's important to be precise when working on these uh, collaboration ideas as well. And I think those are big, big things. I won't touch on the reimagination as much since that's, that's been mentioned, but Marth and Tina as well. But I think if we are able to stick with something at the end of this conversation is that we're all able to learn from each other, not just from the, obviously the end users, as I said at the beginning, but also from other countries and other entrepreneurs and technology experts and education experts working on this topics already for a while, whether that's research that needs to be tested on and just somebody that says, let's try this uh, rapidly and in an agile way and see what worked and what did. And having this mentality will help us shift from the uh, long way of doing education in a very traditional way to a world that enters finally uh, or, or takes finally education into the entrepreneurial world, where it's more about rapid testing and trying, learning as Mart say, maybe more less than 20%. So we're sure that we are still motivated, but continuing on doing this. And I think uh, I will leave it at that. But those are two important things. And I'm happy to have 
heard this uh, one and once again. So that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. So we have now spent 45 minutes already. So we can start to take questions from the audience as well. So uh, concerning what we have learned over the two weeks now uh, in the summer school, so we have listened to the lessons from, for example, 5G and broadcasting, which could open up the new types of or new opportunities for education as well. So we could have worldwide uh, bandwidths, uh, maybe for for educational purposes or learning purposes, and uh, it, it's so much easier to share the knowledge nowadays, but also uh, concerning the, the uh, uh, opportunities uh, related to 5G, the, the sending capacity is, is uh, much bigger than earlier. So we can have like interaction and, and also that people around the world can participate in the discuss, discussions and learning easier than earlier. So I, th I think that we, we have all the, the opportunities to, to start to think global education system. And of course, uh, coming from the North and having the reputation of education of Finland, Estonia, creativity of Sweden, uh, all the all the good uh, standards of living in, in Nordics. So I think that we have chance or good uh, position to, to start to think education which would connect continents and people from different continents and would be, let's say, 30 times, 100 times more efficient than the current system we have. But now let's let's uh, have questions. So do you, do you have questions? So you, you can use the chat, and uh, we we can start answering those. I can I can ask all it if nobody wants to ask. Yes, let's, let's just go ahead. <clears throat> so, Tina, what do you think uh, are the first things that we should now uh, do to enable this um, um, this high quality uh, education innovation ecosystem globally? Wow, that, that, that's a <laughs> that's a million dollars <laughs> question, right? Um, I think it also depends on on the context and kind of uh, kind of the the political context and and regulatory context and 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 how the innovation systems are are working in different countries and so on and so on. Because I really believe that there's so we we already have all the resources and all the kind of all the services and 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 tools to provide quality education for everybody. But um, the innovation is happening in the private sector. And if you look at the kind of private sector learning industry, that's booming. And there's so much happening in there. Uh, and the innovation is incredible. But the problem is that we haven't been able to broker this, this uh, excellent innovation, kind of reap the benefits of that in the public sector. So the majority of the innovation happening in education and learning never sees the classrooms. And, and this is this is a big problem, of course, because we have a challenge uh, with the learning uh, learning access and, and, and quality of of, uh, of education worldwide. Um, and and I really believe that by utilizing this kind of uh, benefits of the platform economy, we are able to broker the the benefits of uh, let's say private sector innovation to the to the public sector, hopefully. Um, but um, there are several reasons that this is not happening right now. One is that, um, well, the government uh, education kind of the formal systems are uh, are siloed and, and kind of isolated from the public sector innovation that's that's uh, uh, happening right now. And if you if you look at the kind of regulation in government procurement, how they can purchase 
uh, services from the private sector providers and so on and so on. Uh, there are big, big challenges there. Then if you look at the business models in the private sector, these are often small, uh, small companies who are providing the kind of pedagogical services and content. And, uh, and they, they don't have the power to market uh, or um, do the feasibility studies to, to cater global audiences. So they are often very, very local. And, um, and they don't really stand, stand a high uh, chance to compete with the, with the education giants. If you look at the big, big corporations like uh, Amazon and, and uh, Apple and Google, and they are all coming to education, not only because they want to, but they also have to. Because that's, for instance, with the Apple, I think they had about 15 million revenue gap that they need to, need to fill. And uh, uh, there aren't that many industries to fill that kind of void. So you have to go to public sector and education is, is big there. So I think by providing this kind of platform that can service and accelerate and support um, the survival and development of uh, SMEs who are uh, providing education services, that's really vital if you want to ensure uh, that we have diversity in this space and it's not just owned by few giants. And uh, I think we also have to make sure that we have rules, clear rules for engagement in this space um, that, uh, that are uh, based on certain values and ethics. It's of inclusivity and, and, and privacy and so on and so on. And if we just leave this to the, the big companies to decide, uh, I don't know what the future of education will look like. So it's really about creating opportunities to broker um, these this amazing innovations and make them accessible to, to broader audiences. I think that's really, really key. And there are several <laughs> things to look at to get this started. Of course, financing is another, uh, another thing besides the regulation and, 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 uh, and providing the services for, for the startups, but then also looking at the, from the uh, learners interface and, and creating business models. So uh, the government governments can also access the services and also individual learners can access the services. These kind of interfaces uh, do not exist. So I think we need a whole kind of operator system connecting the learners and, and the resources worldwide. And, and that's something that we haven't figured out yet, but, but um, something, a uh, food for thought, <laughs> let's say, and, uh, and any, any ideas uh, you might have are, are welcome. Thank you, Tina. And, and doubtless, do you have? We are just about finishing this this session. So, doubtless, do you have what would be the ending words from from Kenya today? <laughs> um, I think uh, for us, it's uh, you know, video games and esports is definitely uh, scaling um, rapidly across the continent. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention, but we 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 also have run. Um, Esports challenges across across 24 African countries uh, to see how to uh, upskill the talent of of young youth uh, who might be good in playing games. Uh, just the same way in Africa, in, in Europe, China, US uh, is happening. Uh, but on the same breath, we we welcome uh, other partners who see how to use the the video games and esports as a channel to. Uh, improve education in one form or, or, or another. Um, and, and maybe just to say that, hey, there's, there's a big potential, there's big youth, and, and there's room uh, for more partners and players. So definitely welcome um, already existing projects like Altro training uh, young people in university here and looking forward to seeing more of this uh, happening. Yeah, thanks. And it's, it's been a pleasure um, engaging with all of you on this panel. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe in the end, so just some news from the 5G Murky at Alta University campus. So we see that these very simple structures could be taken in a number of places worldwide, bringing the 5G network, indoor network, and also the sending capacity uh, kind of studio. So. Uh, even the next version of this 5G Mercury could contain the, the uh, opportunities to, to send the holograms of the speaker to the other side of the world or whatever I would be doing here to 
PR or something like that with, with that, and that could be sent immediately to the other side of the world, and that even increase the, the opportunities for the, for the global education system, which would not be just learning, but also providing immediate opportunities for production and services worldwide. But uh, I, I need to close this session now. I very much thank you all, uh, our panelists, and, and also the audience. And uh, let's keep going. Uh, we have the next lesson starting one o'clock. And uh, let's come back to the 5G Hack the Mall at Aldo University then. Thank you very much. Thank you.